Doors are one of the first things we see when we look at a cabinet. Thanks to their broad surface area, they're the most visible component in a project, so it pays to make them look good. A well-made door should open easily, close without clatter or fuss, and have a comfortable pull that fits the hand. In this video, I hope to show you these attributes and more. From design and construction to fitting and hinging, the world of well-made doors awaits. So let's open it up and take a look inside. Before you cut any wood, the first step in building doors is to decide what type of door you want for the cabinet you'll be making. There are three styles, overlay, half overlay, and flush, sometimes called inset. Each style adds its own look and feel to the front of the cabinet, as well as offering some advantages and disadvantages. Overlay doors are typically seen in modern kitchens, although they work equally well with traditional furniture. Along with overlay drawers, overlay doors cover practically the entire face of the cabinets, offering a sleek and seamless look. Fitting this type of door takes some practice, as the gaps between adjacent doors or drawers must be exact, often an eighth of an inch or less. Half overlay doors, also called lip doors, are typically used on cabinets that have face frames. Rabbits along the edges of the door let it sit partially inside the case opening. This type of door is generally the easiest to fit since the gap between the door and its opening is concealed and the space between adjacent doors and drawers can be relatively large. Keep in mind that a portion of the case or the face frame is seen when using this style of door. So pay attention to the intended look at the front of the case during the design phase. Flush doors, also called inset doors, hang inside and level with the face of the case and require more attention during the fitting stage. To look good, the gaps or reveals between the door and the case opening must be small, often less than a sixteenth of an inch, and the face of the door should be dead flush to the case. These fitting requirements call for a higher level of craftsmanship. However, the look of a well-fitted flush door is satisfying and worthy of an heirloom piece. I typically use flush doors in my best work. Building doors involves first choosing and constructing the cabinet where they'll live. You have two basic choices. A frameless cabinet and a cabinet with a face frame. If you build a case with a projecting top and bottom, you can hinge the door to these surfaces instead of the sides. On a cabinet with a face frame, you attach the door directly to the frame, either on its face or along the inside edge of the frame. The precise location depends on the style of hinge you're using, which we'll cover a little later. Another option is to forgo hinges and build doors that slide on tracks in the case. Just make sure to leave enough depth at the front of the case for the tracks to guide the doors, which usually means setting back shelves, partitions, and the like. Regardless of the type of case you decide to make, make sure to build it first, and then construct the doors based on the size of the finished cabinet opening. Sizing a door to the case involves building the door to a specific dimension, which is always a bit larger than the desired finished product. For example, if I'm building an overlay door, I make it slightly larger, about a sixteenth of an inch longer and wider than I need. Sizing a door this way allows room for smoothing its edges and refining the fit later. After assembly, I can trim it to within a gnat's hair of its size on the table saw and then smooth the edges with the plane. If you're making a half overlay door, size it a half inch larger than the case opening so the door overhangs the opening by a quarter inch on every side. When you add the rabbit on the back side, which is typically 3 8 inch wide, you get about 1 8 inch of clearance between the case and the rabbited edge of the door. This extra 1 8 inch gives you lots of leeway during the fitting and hinging stages. For flush doors, make the door the same size as the case opening. If sized correctly, 
the door will only partially fit into the opening. Later, you'll plane the door for a more precise and exacting fit. The most important construction aspect of any door are the joints that hold it together. To that end, there are two basic choices. Joints for slab style doors and joints for doors with a frame. Joinery for slab doors is usually straightforward. If the door is made from a plywood panel, all you need is to apply some wood edging to conceal the raw edges. If you make the edging about 3 16 inch thick, you can work them after gluing them on by either routing a small roundover or chamfer or by easing the edges with a plane. I've already glued on the top and the bottom edging and I've planed and sanded it flush. Next I'll add the side edging. Spread a generous coat of glue on the plywood edge because it soaks up the glue. I rip my strips a little longer and a little wider than my door panel and then rub the strip into the glue, positioning it so that it's proud of both faces by just a little bit. Position the calls up against the strips and between the clamps. Bring pressure onto the calls with the clamps, but don't fully tighten them yet. Make sure you're positioning the strips so that they're a little proud of the door and keep checking that with your fingers. When everything checks out, you can fully tighten all the clamps. Once the glue is dried, saw the ends of the strip flush with the top and bottom of the door. Then plane the edging as close to flush with the surface of the panel as you dare. And sand the strips so that they're perfectly flush. Next, plane the edges of the door and sand those too. Finish up by detailing the edges of the panel with the block plane to cut a small chamfer. Another option is to move to the router table and use a roundover bit to round over the edges of the panel. Before chamfering the long edges, take a block plane and hit the corners and cut a small chamfer on the end grain of the strips. This will prevent tearing out the edges when you come back to do the long edges. If the door is solid wood, then you need some form of bracing to keep the panel flat and prevent warp. The simplest method is to nail or screw some braces to the back of the door. A more complex but more refined approach is to cap the ends of the panel with breadboards. With this arrangement, the breadboards keep the wide panel from cupping or otherwise warping. The frame and panel door is probably the most common type of door and it answers the problem of wood movement in a clever manner. A relatively narrow frame houses a wider panel. The panel floats inside the frame in grooves, allowing it to shrink and swell without warping because the frame holds it in place. Here, the corner joints do all the work and the mortise and tenon joint rules thanks to its strength. You can cut integral tenons on the ends of the rails that fit into mortises cut into the styles. I'll show this in a bit. Or choose loose tenon joinery where mortises are cut into both the styles and the ends of the rails and separate tenons are glued into both holes to secure the joint. Grooves on the inside edges of the frame pieces hold the panel which is sized along its edges to fit into the grooves. This is the essential corner joint for door frames, the mortise and tenon. Always cut your mortise first and then cut your tenon to fit. This allows you to accurately size the tenon for a perfect fit into the mortise. There are a variety of ways to cut the joint. For the small shop, a plunge router equipped with an edge guide makes the perfect tool for milling mortises. The only downside is that you'll either have to square up the ends of the mortise with a chisel or round over the edges of the tenon with a rasp. Clamp a wide board to the bench to support the router and keep it from tipping and then install the edge guide in your router to guide the cut. Make sure to make the cut in shallow passes.
to produce a clean mortise without stressing out the bit. If your router has a smooth acting plunge mechanism, it's easy to simply eyeball the start and the stop of the cut by looking at your layout lines. Cut the ends of the mortise first. Start by making a cut a little away from your mark line and plunge down about an eighth of an inch. Then move the router a little bit forward and make another plunge cut. This allows clearance for chips to clear as you're cutting down into the wood. Continue this process until you reach the bottom of the mortise. And then back up and line up your bit right on the line and make one continuous plunge all the way down to the bottom of the mortise. Repeat this procedure at the other end of the mortise to define the opposite end. Then cut the middle waist that's left over by making pushing cuts with the router. Again, cutting eighth inch deep with each pass. There are two common ways of making the tenon. The first is to use a tenoning jig, either a commercial one or one that you can make that slides along your rip fence, like this one. Set the blade height for the desired length of the tenon. Adjust the fence using your mortise stock to guide the setup. Then clamp the workpiece vertically in the jig. Make the first cut, then flip the stock to make the second pass, defining the second cheek. To cross cut the shoulders, clamp a stop block well behind the blade and use the miter gauge. Adjust the blade height using the stock. Lay the stock flat to cut the long shoulders. Then stand the work on edge to cut the small shoulders using the mortise to set the blade height. Take a series of nibbling cuts to remove the waste. The second method for cutting a tenon is to use a dado blade. Lay the stock flat on the table saw to cut the cheeks and the short shoulders, again guiding the work with the miter gauge. Cut the cheeks first, then reset the blade to cut the short shoulders. I always test fit my mortise and tenon joints. So how do you know you have the right fit? As a woodworking mentor once said, it shouldn't be so tight that you have to beat it home with a hammer. On the other hand, it shouldn't be so loose that you can tap it together with your hat. If the fit is too loose, glue some veneer to the cheeks and try again. If it's too tight, trim the cheeks with light passes from a shoulder plane. A firm push by hand should do the trick. Because I'm left with rounded ends on my mortise, I'm going to round the edges of my tenon to fit. Use a chisel to cut into the corners by the shoulder. Then use a rasp to round over all four edges. To make a solid panel with breadboard ends, I start by milling a groove in the center of each breadboard using a stacked dado. Make the width of the groove equal to your desired mortise width, in this case a quarter inch. Set the fence so the groove is centered on the stock and raise the blade to cut the groove about a quarter inch deep. Next, use a crosscut sled to form a long tongue on both ends of the panel. Make the tongue about an inch and a quarter long, which will be the finished length of your tenons. An inch and a quarter long tenon will have sufficient strength on a standard size cabinet door. A block clamped to the fence registers the correct length. Use the milled groove in the breadboard to determine the correct fit of the tongue. The breadboard should just slide onto the tongue with slight hand pressure. So that's a good fit there. Divide the tongue into three individual tenons, leaving a quarter inch long tongue or stub tenon between them. Clamp the panel vertically in your crosscut sled to define the edges of the tenons. On the bandsaw, saw to your layout lines to define the short tongues or stub tenons. Use the tenons that you've cut to lay out for the mortises in the breadboards. Lay out for the center tenon, aiming for a snug fit. For each outer tenon, leave about an eighth inch of clearance on either side. In other words, make the mortise a quarter inch longer than the tenon is wide. 
Doing this allows for wood movement across the panel. This time I'm going to square up the ends of the mortises instead of rounding over the tenons. Use a mortise chisel to chop down the ends of the mortise and then use a bevel edge chisel to clean up the sides. Once you've squared the ends, check the fit. If the tenons are still too tight, use the shoulder plane again to trim the fit until you can tap the joint together. With the joints cut, dry assemble the parts and drill through the breadboards for pegs. Lay out the holes about a half inch from the shoulder, which keeps the tenons as strong as possible by avoiding short grain. I use a quarter inch bit to drill the holes. Use a backup block to prevent blowing out the backside. Disassemble the parts and elongate the outer holes in the tenons with a chisel. Make the holes about a half inch long or long enough for the largest amount of expansion you expect the panel to experience. Before we put the door together, I like to take care of a few details. The first thing is to smooth the edges of the panel because this is going to be an area that's hard to reach after assembly. I do this with a hand plane. I'm just removing the machine marks with a few strokes of the plane. Then I like to cut a small chamfer around the panel and on the breadboards, including at the joints. And this creates a nice V-groove when the parts come together, which adds a detail and highlights your joinery. Every now and then I'll reverse the plane. I'm trying to plane with the grain so I don't tear out the fibers of the wood. Now I also like to cut a small cham from the ends of the tenons. This just eases assembly. Time to glue up. Spread glue on the center tenon and in the center mortise only. Then assemble and clamp the parts. I chamfered one end of each peg on a disc sander to help with driving them in. Tap the pegs in, gluing the center peg in place. For the outer pegs, add a dab of glue at the top of the peg. When you drive it home, glue should only make contact with the holes in the breadboard and not on the tenon, leaving the tenon free to expand and contract. Once the glue is dried, level the pegs flush to the surface with the saw. You could also level the ends of the breadboards flush to the ends of the panel if you wish. I like to leave them long because if the panel should expand during really humid weather, at least it won't expand beyond the ends of the breadboards. Next, we're going to look at making a frame and panel door. We've milled the grooves in the styles and rails on the table saw, the same as we did when grooving the breadboard ends. Typical groove depth for a frame and panel door is a half inch, although it really depends on your shaper cutter or router bit. The one I'm using produces a 3 8 inch wide tongue, so I made the groove 3 8 inch deep. Then I laid out and cut the mortises in the styles, locating them 3 8 inch in from the end of each style. Next, mill the tenons to fit the mortises. Cut the cheeks first. You've already cut the 3 8 deep shoulder on the inside thanks to the groove you cut in the rails and styles earlier. To cut the haunch, add an auxiliary fence, reset the blade, and cut the outside shoulder, leaving a 3 8 inch haunch to fill the groove in the style. For a frame and panel door to be successful, it has to account for wood movement. And the way to do this is to make the panel small enough that it has room to move and expand inside the grooves of the frame. Now you can make the panel so small that it'll fall out of those grooves when it shrinks. And here's how I calculate the panel size. Dry clamp the frame together and measure the panel opening. Then add the combined depth of the grooves. In this case, you're going to add three quarters of an inch because our grooves are each three eighths of an inch deep. Then cut the panel to this dimension. To allow for wood movement, you'll need to subtract for the expected amount of expansion. Remember, wood only swells and shrinks across the grain, 
So you only need to remove wood along both long grain edges and not at the top and bottom of the panel. If you're making a flat panel, go ahead and remove this extra bit of wood now. And if you're rabbiting the panel, remove the wood first and then cut the rabbits. However, for a raised panel, profile the edges first and then remove the wood from the sides. As a general rule of thumb, taking away about an eighth of an inch from each edge should be sufficient, assuming your panel is in the neighborhood of, say, 12 inches wide or so. You should remove a bit more wood for wider panels. To remove the excess, I find it easiest to take a few passes over the joiner. Set up a raised panel cutter in the router table and shape the panel with a series of successively deeper cuts. With the bit height set for a light cut, bevel one end grain edge first, followed by shaping the adjacent long grain edge, which removes any tear out from the previous cut. Continue in this fashion around the panel to bevel the remaining sides. Raise the cutter and again shape all four edges in the correct sequence. Make the last cut on each edge a very light one to minimize machine marks and produce a smooth bevel. There are many options when it comes to choosing the panel that goes inside your frame. A flat panel was a hallmark of shaker work, simple and unadorned. And it continues to be a viable design today, whether made from solid wood or veneered plywood. The panel can be made the same thickness as the width of the frame's groove, typically a quarter inch, or it can be made thicker by rabbiting the back or front face. A raised panel is most often associated with frame and panel construction. Style will differ by the size and kind of bevel on the panel, from a simple flat bevel to a more stylized OG edge. You can even bump up the style a bit by adding inlay around the perimeter of the field. For an even wilder look, consider edge gluing two natural edge boards together to create a gap in the middle. You're ready for gluing up. Make sure you have everything on hand before you spread any glue, as time is of the essence here. Spread the glue into the mortises and onto the tenons, but be careful not to get any in the frame grooves or on the panel. Insert a pair of anti-rattle strips into each style groove, which will keep the panel shifting sideways or from rattling during the seasons. Bring the joints together with clamps, using just enough pressure to close the joints, but no more. Check the door for square by measuring opposite diagonals, adjusting the clamps if necessary to pull the frame into square. Also, check the door for flatness, using your eye, a straight edge placed over the work, or do as I do. Check that the frame is making contact with the beams of the clamps underneath. When everything checks out okay, leave the assembly on a flat surface to dry. Here's a variation on the frame and panel door that's based on a plywood panel that you glue into the frame. The great thing about this type of door is that there are no mortises to cut. And the strength of the door comes by the fact that you glue the plywood into the grooves of the frame itself. Now keep in mind you can only do this with a man-made panel such as MDF or plywood and you can't glue a solid wood panel into the frame because wood movement will make the frame self-destruct. Mill the panel grooves in the styles and the rails. Then cut the stub tenons on the ends of the rails to fit the grooves. Cut a hardwood veneered plywood panel so it bottoms out in the grooves or perhaps less by about a sixteenth of an inch. Spread generous amounts of glue into the grooves and onto the stub tenons, then clamp up the door. Cope and stick doors lend themselves to mass production, which is one reason why they're so common in the kitchen cabinet making industry. 
With the right router bits, they're a snap to make in the small shop too. The result is a complex profile, typically a thumbnail or an OG, that surrounds the panel. Coping stick cutters are available in one-piece cutters or in match sets. I prefer the two-piece sets where one cutter cuts the sticking as well as cuts the groove for the panel. The second cutter copes the ends of the rails to match the sticking. Install the sticking bit in the router table and route the styles and rails with the face of the stock down on the table. Use a push stick for accuracy and safety. For now, keep the rail stock oversized and width for safer handling during the next step. Once all the sticking is cut, install the coping bit in the table and adjust it to the correct height by comparing it to one of the sticking pieces. First, cope a piece of extra frame stock along one long edge, then nest this piece into the stuck profile of the rail stock to prevent exit tear out. Keeping the rail stock wide at this point allows you to run it steadily past the cutter without tipping. Rip the coped rail stock into individual rails on the table saw. Before you assemble your door frames, it makes sense to plane or at least smooth the inside edges of your frames. These parts are hard to get to after assembly, so now's the time to do it. Assemble the door gluing the frame joints only or the frame and the panel if the panel is made from plywood. At the ends of the door you see the exposed stub tenon and coped area while the inner frame displays a handsome profile and neatly coped inside corners. The typical half inch long stub tenon that joins the styles to the rails on a cope and stick door isn't strong enough to resist the forces the doors face. To beef up the joint consider using dowels let into holes drilled in the adjoining surfaces. Or even better, loose tenons glued into the mortises cut into the edge of the style and the ends of the rails. A plunge router equipped with a suitable straight bit makes quick work of cutting the mortises and the tenons are easily formed on the table saw. Glass doors really add visual appeal to many projects and this one may be simpler to make than you thought. Start by building and assembling your frame, making sure the joints are sound and the frame goes together square. Attach an oversized base plate to your router and chuck on a rabbiting bit equipped with a bearing that creates a half inch wide rabbit. Set the depth to cut the rabbit about 3 8 inch deep, depending on the thickness of your stock. Initially guide the router freehand around the frame avoiding cutting too deep for fear of tear out. Make progressively deeper cuts until the bearing rides the surface of the stock during a full pass around the frame. The router bit will leave rounded corners so you're going to want to square these up by hand which I do with a chisel. First lay out the corners with a small ruler. Then chisel to the line taking light cuts and sneaking up on the line. Make the glass retainers from leftover wood, mitering their corners or butting them together. Your choice. Measure the rabbit at opening and have a glass shop cut the glass about an eighth inch smaller than your measurements. Glass expands slightly so you need to leave a bit of room. Spread a small bead of silicone caulk onto the rabbit. Place the glass onto the silicone and nail the retainers into the frame with angled brads or with a pin nailer. Pegs can highlight the joints in a door and can also save time and clamps when it comes to assembling the frame. Keep in mind that for the most part pins and pegs won't strengthen the connection, but they look good and at least they'll hold parts together should the glue ever fail sometime way down the road. Pinning a joint with brads or pin nails, especially when shot with a nail or pin gun, offers a quick way to keep a frame connected until the glue dries. A good technique if you have a boatload of doors to assemble and you're short on clamps. First, clamp the door together, then pin the joints from the backside. Remove the clamps and move on to another door. Regular dowels work great for pegs. Drill a round hole, drive them in with glue, and saw and sand them flush. 
Hardware store dowels make good pins, but there's better stuff available. Bamboo, a strong and resilient material, makes fantastic pins and pegs. Even better, it's available in 1 8 inch diameters, sold in packages as bamboo skewers in grocery stores, or in 3 16 diameters in the disguise of bamboo chopsticks from your favorite restaurant. Use a backup block to avoid blowing out the back of the door. For extra punch, try adding a pair of pins for each joint. Square pegs can really add flair. Drill a round hole and square it up with a chisel. Rip some square stock and cut each peg a bit over long. Bevel one end of each peg with a sanding block, then drive in the peg with glue, leaving the end a bit proud. Once the glue's dried, saw these flush also. Even though you work carefully and attentively and your door came together nice and flat and square, chances are you're left with some slight misalignments on the corner joints that need smoothing up. And overall, there are most likely machine marks left on the wood from the milling process. And I like to remove these and get my work nice and smooth. Now you can use sandpaper, sanding by hand with a block and some sandpaper or a random orbit sander. But the danger with sanding is that you tend to round over surfaces. Also, sanding is dusty work. And believe it or not, it's slow. The tool for the job is a hand plane. It's fast, it's clean, and it's reliably flat and leaves your doors nice and flat. Make sure your iron is sharp and set the blade for a very light cut. This way, you'll get minimal tear out and you'll keep the frame nice and flat just like you assembled it. Check the grain direction on each frame part by looking at its edge and for the most part try to plane with the grain. When you come to a corner simply plane around it. I finish up by lightly sanding the entire surface using a random orbit sander fitted with 220 grit paper. This removes any small tear out or track marks left by the plane. Many doors can be fitted to the case right off the table saw, perhaps with a quick smoothing on their edges with the hand plane or a sander. But for a flush fit door, it pays to be a little more picky. First off, I build my flush fit doors to the size of the case opening. Done right, the door should barely, but not quite, fit into the case. For an exacting fit, my goal is to create an even reveal all the way around the door in the case so the door enters the case with an even gap all around. The key is to use a hand plane so you can remove material in tiny controllable amounts. Begin by placing two shims at the bottom of the case and rest the door on the shims. Squares of plastic laminate about a sixteenth of an inch thick work well for this. If the door won't fit into the case at all remove some wood from one of the styles, either by making a rip cut on the table saw or taking a few shavings with a plane. At this point, the top of the door shouldn't enter the case. Check the gap along the hinge style. Chances are the gap is tapered, which means either the door or the case isn't perfectly square. Note the amount of taper and at the bench use a plane to remove the same amount of taper but from the bottom of the door and not its side. Notice the taper starting to disappear. I've got a little less gap up top now. That means I need to take a little more off of this corner of the bottom. So I'll go back to the bench. Make sure you plane in from each end so you avoid blowing out the grain on the styles. When the hinge side and bottom gaps are consistent, trim the top of the door to create a gap of about a 32nd of an inch. If the top and bottom edges of the opening are parallel, 
and the amount of material you need to remove is significant, you can trim the door on the table saw, registering the bottom edge against the rip fence. Otherwise, use the hand plane again. Keep checking the fit as you go, holding the hinge style tight against the opening and looking to see that the gap is consistent along the style and equal top and bottom. At this point, the gaps on the sides of the door need to be widened to allow for hinging. To create the necessary clearance, remove enough material from the hinge style for a combined gap of about a sixteenth of an inch. Do this on the table saw or with a plane, taking aggressive cuts. Let's check the fit one more time. Okay, I've got even gaps top and bottom. My hinge style is tight and on the free side I've got an even gap of about a sixteenth of an inch. Now it's time to add hinges. A smooth working door is directly related to its hinges, so it pays to buy the best. Look for solid castings or extrusions, which are sturdier than the stamp variety. Thick leaves and precision made barrels or knuckles that pivot smoothly without play. After that, choose the hinge that best works for the type of door you're hanging. Some can be used interchangeably for flush, half overlay and overlay doors, others can't. Also, consider what you'll see on the outside of the cabinet once the door is hinged. On the one hand, you have a surface mounted hinge, which puts the whole kit and caboodle on display. For a more inconspicuous look, you can use knife hinges, which reveal button sized barrels and little else. For the look of no hardware at all, you can choose barrel or cup hinges. And don't forget the ubiquitous butt hinge, which is readily available in a range of sizes, materials, and finishes, and strikes a good balance between ease of installation, sturdy action, and good looks. Once the door is fitted, it's time to install the hinges. In general, for paired hinges, you can install them a few inches from the top and bottom of the door, or perhaps in line with the, a rail for visual harmony. If the door is particularly tall, you could add a third hinge, perhaps in the middle of the door or upwards a little bit towards the top to resist the extra forces as the door is open. Note that it can be awkward to route or chisel mortises in an assembled case, so it's often smart to cut your mortises in the case before gluing it up. To locate the mortises in the door, position it in the case and transfer the mating mortise locations with a knife. Installing butt hinges requires that you determine the amount of setback, which is the amount the leaves extend in the case or door. To calculate the setback, measure from the long edge of a leaf to the center of the barrel, then subtract a sixteenth of an inch. Now transfer this measurement to the case and door. Next, determine the depth of the mortises in the case and door, which is typically the thickness of one leaf. The easiest way to do this is to chuck a small straight bit into a small router and then set the cutting depth equal to a leaf held against the base plate. Route the mortise freehand, cutting as close to your layout lines as possible, but without going over. Be sure not to tip the router, keeping the mortise as flat as possible. Chisel to the shoulder lines by hand, first chopping the ends of the mortise and then carefully paring the long back edge. Drill pilot holes for one of the screws in each leaf on both the case and the door. A self-centering bit makes easy work of this. Install the hinge in the door, then install the door to the case. Check the fit. If you need to make any adjustments, back off either the case screws or the door screws, adjust the door, and install a set of screws in adjacent holes. Once the door fits, install the remaining screws. At this stage of the game, I'm going to use steel screws as opposed to the brass ones that come with the hinge because I can drive these in and out without deforming them. And in the final fit, I'll add the brass screws at the very end.
If you accidentally go a little too deep in your mortise, here I've got just a little ledge here that I don't like. I want this hinge to be flush to the wall. What you can do is use some paper, some post-it notes actually. I'm going to take one, two, three, four pieces, four pieces, and fill the bottom of the mortise with a stack. You can just press that right into the mortise, and that acts as a shim to bring your hinge level to your edge. With the door hung, close the door and check the gap on the non-hinge side or the free swinging style. Typically it's either too tight and may have a small amount of taper. Now my gap looks pretty good except I've got a bit of a tight spot down here so I'm going to take some taper off back at the bench. Remove the door from the case and plane a slight back bevel onto the non-hinge style at the same time removing any taper and producing an even gap. Install the door again and check your reveals. A well-fitted door should have a consistent gap of a sixteenth inch or less all the way around the cabinet opening. Check the fit. If you need to make any adjustments, back off either the case screws or the door screws, adjust the door, and install a set of screws in adjacent holes. Once the door fits, install the remaining screws. Let's see what I got. Yeah, that's good. Also called Euro hinges, cup hinges are relatively big and ugly pieces of gear, but the good news is that they're only visible inside the case. The nice thing about cup hinges is that they're relatively easy to install. Once you fit the door and install the hinge, you can then adjust the door to fit simply with the screwdriver on the hinge itself. You can buy cup hinges that attach to the face frame or you can buy a cup hinge that attaches either to a divider in the case or to the case side itself with the use of a base plate. Now I like the cup hinges that have a self-closing feature. They're spring-loaded, so they snap shut, which means that you don't need a closing mechanism when you close the door. The cup part of the hinge installs in a hole drilled in the back of the door. To lay out the hole, refer to the manufacturer's instruction for the amount of setback, which is the distance from the edge of the door to the center of the hole. Now on this door, I'm going to measure down three inches from each end and mark my hole centers from those dimensions. I'll refer to this dimension later when I go to install the base plate in the cabinet. Install a 35 millimeter cup hinge bit on the drill press. So I made a little mark here a half inch down from the back of the door, and I'm just going to line up my bit, or the depth of my bit, to that mark, lock the spindle, and then use my depth stop as a stop to limit the depth of cut. Now I'm ready to drill the real thing. Now a 1 and 3 8 inch Forster bit can be used in a pinch. If you don't have a press, there are commercial jigs that work with 35 millimeter bits that you chuck into a handheld drill. Use a small square to align the hinge to the edge of the door. Then drill pilot holes for screws using a self-centering bit. Drive the screws to secure the hinge to the door. To measure the depth of the base plate in the case, I'm going to attach it to the hinge itself and then I'm going to take a measurement. So I'm going to go to these side holes here and it looks to be about an inch and seven sixteenths or inch and a half. Let's call it an inch and a half. So I'm going to set my square to an inch and a half and lay that out in the case. Now 
Remember I measured three inches down from the ends of my door to install my hinges. So I'm going to add that dimension from the top and bottom of my case. Plus I'm going to add a little bit for the door gap up top, which is going to be about a sixteenth of an inch. So up here, I'm going to measure down about three and one sixteenth of an inch and make a mark. Now I've got a center line for the base plate. At the bottom, I'm going to measure three inches up from the bottom of the cabinet. Make a mark and then I'll transfer that inside the case. Drill pilot holes with the self-centering bit and install the plates to the case. Now simply slide the door hinges onto the base plates and they'll snap in place and then secure them with a screw. Check the fit. With cup hinges, the door can be adjusted three ways, forwards and backwards, side to side, and up and down. Use a screwdriver to make any necessary adjustments. The gap looks good, but I've got to bring this side of the door, which is the non-hinge side, out a little bit so it's flush with the drawer face above. And I'm going to do that later with a rubber bumper behind the door. Many people consider the knife hinge to be the Rolls Royce of hinges. They provide silky smooth action and emanate a jewelry-like presence. There are two styles, straight hinges and offset or dogleg hinges. I prefer the two-part hinges because the leaves separate, making installation easier. When choosing offset hinges, be sure to specify right-hand hinges for doors that are hinged on the right side of the case and left-hand hinges for left swinging doors. Again, cut the case mortises before assembling the cabinet, using the same layout and routing procedure as when installing butt hinges. You need to fit the door to create top and bottom reveals that equal the thickness of the hinge washer. Lay out the end of the leaf flush with the edge of the door. To calculate the correct setback, move the hinge back until the hinge pin hole is halfway between the face of the cabinet, minus about a sixteenth of an inch, just like you would with a regular butt hinge. In this case, because my door is so thin, I'm just going to move it back about a sixty-fourth of an inch past the center of the hole. Now hold the leaf in that position and scribe around it with a sharp knife to outline your mortise. Now cut the mortise as you would for a butt hinge. To create the necessary gap between the door and the case side, you need to offset the case mortise away from the case side. In this case, I moved it in about a sixty-fourth of an inch to create a sixty-fourth inch gap between my case and door. Screw the pin leaves into the case mortises, press each mating leaf onto its pin, then slide the door between the blades. Carefully open the door and, as with butt hinges, install a single screw in each hinge and check the fit. Make any adjustments by lengthening one or both of the mortises with the chisel, then drive the final screws. Pulls and handles offer a finishing touch offering good looks and a comfortable grip. The keys to success are twofold. Use a comfortably shaped knob and attach it to the door in such a manner that it's secure and in a spot where it's easy to grasp. You can buy handles and pulls in a variety of styles and materials, although many woodworkers prefer to make their own, which is a great way to personalize your work. Most commercial knobs are secured via bolts from the back of the door. For shop made poles, you can turn or carve a tenon on the back of the pole, then drill or chisel a mortise in the door and glue the tenon into the mortise. For extra security, you can drive wedges into kerfs cut into the tenon to secure the knob. All doors need some form of stop to prevent them from swinging inward beyond the plane of the face and stressing out the hinges. A simple approach is to nail or screw a block of wood to the case, perhaps at the top. Instant door stop. If your hinges are free swinging, as opposed to self-closing hinges, then you need some way of keeping the door closed once it's in place. Here's a simple trick. 
drill a hole in the case bottom, and install an end grain wooden plug. Then shave the plug with a sharp chisel until the bottom of the door rubs on the plug. Of course, with overlay and half overlay doors, the case itself serves as the stop. With flush doors fitted to cases with face frames, you can inset the top and bottom of the case so their front edges are partially exposed in the frame opening to act as door stops. If this approach isn't feasible with your cabinet design, there are other stopping options. One of the easiest types of stops is this adjustable magnet stop. It's simple to install, and even better, you can adjust the magnet in or out after installing the door, helping level the door to the front of the case. The stop has a barbed tenon, so all you need is the appropriate size hole in the case to secure it. Drive the stop into the hole with a soft-headed mallet. Mark where the stop makes contact with the door, then secure the metal washer to the back of the door with a screw. If you want to get fancy, first drill a shallow hole with a Forstner bit, and then install the washer so it projects about a 32nd inch or so from the back of the door. Use a wide bladed screwdriver to adjust the magnet in or out until the front of the door sits level with the case. Rare earth magnets make great door stops and can add a sense of magic and mystery. If you install them behind wood plugs, you conceal their pulling power. In general, a pair of 3 8 inch diameter magnets is sufficient to pull a standard cabinet door closed. Drill holes in the case before assembly. Once you've hung the door, drill matching holes with a Forstner bit in the top and bottom of the door. Keep the holes shallow, say a quarter inch deep, or just deep enough to house the magnet as well as a wood plug that's about a sixteenth of an inch thick. Install the magnets with epoxy, don't forget to align their polarities for attraction, and then tap an overlong wooden plug into the hole and over the magnet. When the epoxy is dried, level the plug with a chisel. If you're using self-closing hinges, you can use a soft-closing door stop which consists of a piston-like cylinder that slowly retracts as the spring action of the hinge presses the door against it. The result? A door that closes softly and quietly. One style of soft closer is available on cup hinges only and it's incorporated into the hinge itself. Another variety is a separate piece of hardware that you install near the non-hinge side of the door, typically at the top. If you have an overhanging face frame, screw the closer to a block of wood. Size the block so its thickness equals the frame's overhang. Glue and screw the block to the case, making sure the face of the housing is flush with the back of the door. When the door is closed, the plastic piston retracts slowly until the door rests flush with the case. Doors with free swinging hinges need a catch mechanism to keep the door closed. Spring-loaded catches are the answer. One of the simplest is the bullet catch, which consists of a bullet-shaped spring-loaded ball that projects from a small cylinder and a striker plate that receives the ball. You install the ball cylinder into a small hole in the case and not the door to prevent rub marks on the face of the case. Then install the strike at the top of the door. Another version is the ball and latch catch, a two-piece mechanism consisting of a tongue plate that attaches to the back of the door and a double ball housing that's screwed to the case. Case closed. 